Before we get to questions, we have samples, and that would be a interesting mm -hmm. fruit, vegetable uh, fruit. Yeah, I had a client bring this in this week, and I was pretty impressed. And this is uh, this is now an opportunity to create a new alias name for a certain pest that I will show you. But this is tomatillo, mm. and if you look at it very carefully, it doesn't look appetizing at all. In fact, it's got holes in it that you can see there, and lots of what oh we in goodness. entomology call frass. In wildlife, they call it something else, I think, but um, we call it frass. Well, what did this? Um, and it turns out, you can see on the front here, the very front of the screen on the, the little sh the covering for the tomatillo, oh, that's a corn earworm, a.k.a. tomato fruit worm, a.k.a. cotton boll worm, a.k.a. now tomatillo borer. Huh. So uh, apparently uh, the client described this as going from one tomatillo to another, you know, just kind of dining a little bit and then moving on to another. So they're creating this unsightly damage and now it's going to be a, a delay before a good number of uh, jars of green salsa can be made up with this. So what do you do about it? You know, when you're harvesting something like this, and that's true, like in the garden right now, we're you know, all enjoying the harvest. And you have some pests that, that uh, attacks one of your fruits or whatever, there's not much you can do because there aren't insecticides that, are, that can be used. Uh, they, the only one I can think of is like carbaryl or possibly permethrin. Uh, pyrethrins would be very good because they break down very quickly, like, so you can use those within one day. But uh, th this is one of these examples where sometimes you just got to take your hits, you know, and en enjoy what you did salvage and what you got. But the insects are always going to be taking their share too. So. Remember now, tomatillo borer. <laughs> and I'm glad you I'm glad you actually figured that out because I think we've had a couple of questions about mm. that this year and we, we didn't Good. know. So Good. excellent. Thank yep. you. All right, Dennis, you have a dead creature. Yeah, it's a stuffed vole. And the reason why I brought it is because we're getting a number of calls about damage to things like cucumbers, zucchinis, and even pumpkins. And we're seeing the rind or the skin eaten, and I've determined in several cases that it's from the vole. And so they're living around the gardens and they're getting in there and they're actually starting to carve the pumpkin on their own. Um, and voles, have, you can't really see their eyes, especially this one since the eyes are not there anymore. But they're small little eyes, you can't see their ears and they have a very short tail. But this is a vole and the multi-catch box traps, which actually catch them alive, are probably your best way to get them. And you get to wind up those traps and hold up to 15 of them. But they will try to carve your pumpkin before you want to. So. And They're in the garden, take care of them. And when you catch them this year in the multi-catch trap, do not release them in our garden. Okay, I won't. <laughs> okay, Amy, what do you have for us? Well, tonight I brought some sunflower rust. Um, my sunflowers are just nice and nice and uh, blooming very nicely, but I'm starting to see these spots appearing on them. This is the top upper leaves um, right along the head of the sunflower right now. You can see all the brown spots on there, a little bit of yellow discoloration. Now this sunflower rust is a little unique because it will form pustules on the upper leaf and on the bottom of the leaf. So we can see these brown pustules up there and they're easier to see when I flip them over. All those little orange rusty spots are all the spores. And the one easy way to always identify whether you have a rust, whether it's on sunflowers, hollyhocks, any other type of plant species is you can take your finger and actually rub across it. And a lot of times you're gonna be able to see it come off on your finger if you have a white piece of cloth. Um, it will turn that brown or rusty color. But the other big thing is if you go back to the spot where you looked, it's actually smooth in coloration. So you can kind of see where I smudged right there. Mm -hmm. It changes in colors. And so this is initial infection. It's actually pretty severe. And then this is what the leaf looks like within a week or two. You start getting some decay, necrosis, and then the leaf is just going to eventually just die and be done for the year. Um, most of the time we don't recommend anything for sunflower rust to be treated. You may want to make sure the area is well, uh, lots of air circulation, a lot of sunlight. And that's my problem here. This is on the east side of the building. I have sunlight from sunrise until about oh, 1130. And then it's in the shade the rest of the day. So there's lots of humidity, not a lot of uh, evaporation of the dew. So it's been very favorable for the rust to take off. And I did not do that on purpose either, so. <laughs> All right, thanks, Amy. Okay, Jeff, a couple of really popular shrubs. Yeah, I brought in um, two hydrangeas today. The, the white flowering one is a uh, paniculata, it's uh, limelight. 
And these are just here in this last week, really starting to get going. They've kind of they've been holding on to their their blooms here a while, but I think um, with the rain we had today, this one really opened up today, and so and I think with a little bit of heat next week, they'll probably really get going. And then the the brown one here, I didn't get at a local uh, hobby store, as I was accused <laughs> of. This actually came out of my yard, but this is oak leaf hydrangea. And this is, it's, you know, late summer, early fall. It's, it's kind of a nice one. It's, it adds a little bit different effect to the, to the uh, shrub border right now. So it's kind of nice. And both of those are 100% woody. Right? Yes, right. Yeah. So yep. great additions to the shrub border. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you all. All right, Jim, you get the first picture. And this is actually, uh, the viewer who sent this in thinks they know what it is. Oh, good. Dakin, Nebraska. She said she thinks it's a cropia moth. Found 15 on the ivory halo dogwood, just happily wow, munching. Wow, that's amazing. Is she right? Yeah, she is right. And that one looks like it's mature and ready to wander off and spin a cocoon somewhere, maybe right there on the dogwood itself. 15 of them? She must enjoy seeing them. Otherwise, I mean. It's eaten size. No yeah, <laughs> for something. Yeah. Put yeah. that on a hot dog bun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. yeah, wait till next year. It'll be like triple the amount. Oh, gee. Just beautiful, too. That's yeah. a beautiful caterpillar. All right, um, Dennis, you get this first, and then Amy will weigh in on this one. Okay. Uh, this is a viewer uh, up in, in Dodge. And the grapes have, I think our viewers can see pretty well there, kind mm -hmm. of those blotchy, spotchy things on them. and. I know that we've had a lot of questions about creatures eating grapes, right. and then Amy's some, some follow-up yeah. maybe on what, what this is. Well, a number of creatures love grapes. Uh, opossums, raccoons, and even birds will take grapes. But I think with looking at that picture, we can't blame those animals for that damage in that picture, even though they may be doing some damage to the grapes in another location. To me, that looks like a possible disease. It Amy. is. It's most likely bunch rot. Very common fungal disease that we see. Actually, in grapes, we have about five or six fungal diseases that we see. And so the best thing with grapes, especially with the rains that we've been receiving, best thing with grapes is you need to follow a fungicide program. And you start that in the beginning of the spring, and you keep going through to protect those bunches of fruit from the disease from forming. Uh, Michigan State has a wonderful small fruit fungicide guideline program that will tell you exactly what times you should be hitting according to the proper growth stages. And you said bunch rot, bunch. as in great bunch. Great bunch. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. All right, uh, Jeff, you or Amy, I guess you get a picture okay. still. So you, you, you get double duty. I get duty. two for one. You get two <laughs> wow. for one. Uh, this is a viewer, they don't really tell us where they're from, but they have pear trees. The leaves have spotted and dropped early, starts out with the beautiful flowers, so... <clears throat> probably one of the ornamental pears from the sounds of things. And then within two months, they start to see this. Uh, they don't have any visible girdling roots. They, you know, th this actually started a few weeks ago. So they're seeing this progress. And when I looked at these pictures, I actually had to think about this one for a little bit. Um, the one thing I noticed is if you notice the picture clear on the right-hand side, it has all that browning right along the margin. I'm leaning toward anthracnose because this is where the water is going to sit longer and we're going to get a lot more spore germination to occur. And theracnose on trees, whether it's pears, hawthorns, sycamores, whatever tree you're looking at is going to be very common this year because of those frequent rains that we have been receiving, very thankful for. But we're going to see a lot of anthracnose development. Typically, we don't recommend anything unless it's a very young tree or a tree that's very stressed. And if that's the case, you're going to come in with a fungicide application but you will have to typically go with a commercial applicator because you need a full coverage of the tree, top to bottom until drip. And most of the time as a homeowner, you can't get the full coverage of the tree. So if it's a young tree or tree that's stressed, you go ahead and treat it. If not, just make sure you rake up all the leaves this fall and that really does help reduce the inoculum level for next year. All right, thanks Amy. Jeff, you have uh, two different sets of lily pictures. Okay. The first is actually from a viewer who wants to know what they are, and I think he sent us both the, the plant itself and then a close-up of the actual flower. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what is that one? So this looks like surprise lily to me. Mm -hmm. So and it's, it looks like the common one. And, and actually, earlier this spring or early summer, they would have seen the leaves, and it has nice foliage. So I think sometimes folks ignore the fact that they have it you know, showing up. So, and it should spread here 
I know there's just a few there, but over time they should end up with mm -hmm. several in that area. So. And the name surprise is because why? Well, because the leaves kind of disappear in the heat of the summer, and then yeah. they come back up here late late summer, early fall. We'll start yeah, there's a lot of them, at least around the Campus. urban area here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everywhere about synchronized emergence or something. And they have a tendency to spread. I mean, we see right. them in places that, you know, even on campus right now, we have them showing up in spots that we haven't planted them. I mean, they've, they've kind of volunteered their way in. So. Ninja planting. Huh? Ninja planting. Ninja planting, yeah. Right. And I think you have another picture, too. And this is a viewer who has had lilies. And all of a sudden, she's got an entire bouquet on, on yeah. the end of one wow. stem. That's very Ooh. cool, isn't it? Yeah. And that's fasciation, so, and that occurs, um, it's not unusual in Asiatic lilies, um, and fasciation can be caused by a variety of things, and sometimes it's not very well explained or, or well understood. It's something that's bacteria, it could be damage to the plant at some point, may, may have caused it. Um, and so it may or may not return in that particular plan. Mm -hmm. So enjoy it now. Next year it may not show up, or it may. So Jim, you get the first question tonight. This is a Juanita viewer who has burr oaks, and they say that the trunk has tiny worm holes around the surface. They don't say how big the oaks are, but they're wondering: is that a concern, or are there particular things that well, might be? Well, burr oaks are a very hardy tree, and most likely, anything that has attacked them is part of this larger community that's wild that it's it's very tolerant of. Um, the only thing I can think of are there are some oak borers that come out mid-season in the latter part of the season, and they resemble yellow jacket wasps of, of all things. But that's a possibility if they're, they tend to be a round hole and maybe about the size of a pencil. But uh, if you notice that, you know, check it every day or so, see if there's more of them showing up. And if that's the case, they are emerging. So that'd be the time to treat it with an insecticide if you'd like to at the base of the trunk, uh, just to keep them from reinfesting at that point. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Dennis, a critter question. This is a viewer who says uh, a snake got into their garage and it's hiding in there. They want to know how to get the snake out. Should they trap it or should they poison it? I, okay, first of all, <laughs> we know people, the answer on that. Some people have all the luck, yeah. <laughs> but um, you can't poison the snake. It's not. There's no toxicant on the market that one well, snake will take or that will poison the snake. So it's a matter of chasing it out. Um, it probably doesn't want to be in the garage unless you have a large rodent population in the garage, and then you may want it. If it is a garter snake, then you may have a large insect population in the garage. But if you just move things around, um, especially where it's hiding, it will probably try to get out as best it can. If that doesn't work, you can use a somewhat moist towel against the wall and then stretch a dry burlap or towel over that. If it's dry throughout the garage, and then they'll seek that moisture area. And then you can just lift up the towel very quickly, sweep it into a bucket, and get it out of the garage. All right. Sounds simple. Sounds yeah. simple. Yeah, for people who are not concerned about snakes. Yeah, call you, right? Yeah, call me. <laughs> okay, Amy, uh, we had a viewer send in an, um, a lot of, actually some PDFs about hostapetiole rot and had found it, had, had uh, thought that they had actually identified that as an issue. Is that something you've seen in the clinic or you're familiar with at all? I am familiar with it. I've never seen it in the clinic, and I don't believe Kevin has seen it either. Um, what I know of hosta petiole rot, it's usually down in the south, a lot warmer conditions, moist, very moist conditions. Um, but it's a fungal disease, and basically what happens is the fungus colonates down at there at the crown of the hosta, and then it just causes those petioles to rot, and then you'll see the leaves start to die and fall off. Um, if you believe that's what you have, the best thing to do is you need to monitor your moisture. Um, if you're watering, you're probably overwatering. If you've been lucky to get all those wonderful rains, you need to pull the mulch back away to allow it to drain or do some switching of your drainage. Uh, it could be a low spot in your landscape and all the water's accumulating there. So best thing is you want to try to get that hosta and that crown dry to help reduce that fungus from growing. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, Jeff, this is a Randolph viewer who has a question about organic seed. Okay. They're saying that they, they have uh, used it before. It doesn't seem to germinate well. They're not saying what crops, other than okay. that they have a lot of them. And the question really is, is, do we think that organic seed does not actually stay viable as long as 
non-organic seed. I wouldn't think that it would make any difference, <clears throat> to be honest with you. I, and so if they're having problems with germination, it would be my guess that the seed is old mm -hmm. uh, or it's been compromised in some way at some point. But I don't think, whether it's organic or not, that makes that any should, difference. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. All right, Jim, you get the next um, question and a couple of pictures from a viewer who uh, had, a, had a baptisia. And she said that it, the leaves were all brown and crispy. She cut it down. Then she found that at the base. They're still desperate, aren't they? Yeah, and she did say she used some aid around the stem. Mm -hmm. She's wondering if that will save the plant or if she has, in fact, lost the plant entirely. Yeah, you can talk about the, the plant, <coughs> I, I suppose, right after my turn here. But essentially, that's genistic caterpillar, and it appears that it's been uh, quite... Uh, the population has been very high this year because we've had many, many complaints about it in, attacking Baptisia plants. And one thing about it is that it is a bit insidious, meaning that if you don't keep watching, you know, watching it, the host plants, you know, all of a sudden it'll just seem like they're overrun and just devoured. And that's what's happened. Population's high, they're devoured. But I don't believe, you know, um, for my share in, with entomology, if you notice it early, that's the best thing. And you can apply something like the Bacillus thuringiensis formula or the spinosad, and though there's both non-chemical options, or you can use good old-fashioned carbaryl or permethrin with thorough coverage to deal with them early. But as far as the health of the, the shrub, is it, a, is it a goner? That's the question. Oh, I wouldn't think so, no. No, no I yeah. wouldn't worry about it. And I don't know if I would cut it back <coughs> either. I mean, I know it's a little unsightly, but there's, it's still, those green stems are still working, mm -hmm. so I would leave it alone right now. I've got a couple in my yard doing the same thing, had the same thing happen to them. And right, it's a pretty tough perennial. Yeah. So, okay, Dennis, you get the next one. Uh, this is a viewer who says, this is the tiniest little snake they've ever seen on the east side of Council mm -hmm. Bluffs. So that's where they live. Can I add one more thing to my last question yeah. uh, about the snake in the garage? Um, people maybe wonder about repellents, and the reason I didn't talk about repellents is that I've done a lot of testing with all the repellents possible for snakes, mothballs, lime, ammonia, you name it, none of them work. They're a waste of time. So there is no repellents for snake that laboratory tests show that they have any effectability. Okay. I'll leave it as that, it's been published. That is Storaria decayi. It's the little brown snake. They give live birth, and that's a newly born one. They usually give huh. about five to 10 little tiny babies. Um, the snake itself doesn't grow bigger than about 12 to 16 inches when it's a full grown adult, a large adult. Most of them are less than about six inches. But the babies, probably just two to three centimeters long. Hmm. They eat mainly slugs. And they, when they get older, they'll put their head into ground snails and pull out the snails, escargot-type mm. meals. Oh, cool. <laughs> so they're beneficial in all ways. They carry no germs and viruses, can't hurt you, and it's a baby snake of a small species. Very now, cool. decay I is not, doesn't mean decay. It's the name, no, of, the, it's name of the... Name of the herpetologist out of yeah. New York uh, in the 1800s, uh, Mr. Decay. <laughs> Excuse me, Dr. Decay. That's not, that's not, uh, a, that's not a great name. Right. <laughs> All right, Amy, this is uh, decayed, actually. This is from <laughs> Stockham, Nebraska. A uh, viewer with nectarines say the fruit gets almost ripe and then it molds and rots. And this is the second or third year this has happened. This is the famous brown rot of stone fruit. So you're going to see this on plums, cherries, apricots, and nectarines. It always happens right when your fruit is ready to be harvested and it turns that nice big powder ball of spores and the whole fruit is unedible. Um, best thing to do is going to be following a fungicide program uh, for fruit trees that you can find uh, most websites. Uh, you have to be careful to make sure that you're using products that can be used on fruit trees uh, and watch the restricted uh, interval. Uh, pre-harvest interval, sorry, before you can harvest those fruits. With apricots, this is from Lauren's experience. Lauren is able, off of his tree, he's able to pick them right before they're ripe, and then he puts them in a hot water bath, really fast, hot boiling water, just for a couple seconds, and that kills all the spores that are on the surface, and then he allows them to finish ripening on his countertop, and he's been able to save a lot of apricots that way. So you can also try that as another remedy instead of using those fungicides um, that most people are trying to get away from. All right, excellent, but, and that certainly does not look palatable. It is not palatable, <laughs> and it goes so quickly, too. You barely see a brown yeah. spot, and you come back two days later, the whole fruit's gone. All right. Uh, Jeff, this is a viewer in Lincoln with knockout roses. Okay. 
that don't look very good and they have stopped blooming. And, mm -hmm. and I thought maybe you'd like to talk about your experience with those on campus. Well, you know, and that's to be expected this time of year. I mean, right now is probably the roughest time of the year for the roses, or we're kind of coming out of it. I noticed today on campus some of the roses are starting to rebloom. So, and with the cool weather and the rain, we're going to see some reblooming of our roses right now. At this point, if yours aren't looking so good, um, you know, if there's some dead, we had some dead uh, tips on some of our roses here, I think, from some of our heat, and we pruned some of that off. But you could do some of that light pruning and just be patient and... I think in a few weeks, you'll start seeing them come back. All right, Jim, I believe you get the next picture. <clears throat> this is a gray insect that is feeding, and I think you can see it right, right in the middle, in the middle there. And then yeah. one's on the upper left. And it's yeah. feeding on anemone, which is kind of an okay. interesting, or at least it looks like it is. All right. Uh, this is a ash gray blister beetle, and there are a number of blister beetles in Nebraska. One is a striped blister beetle, and there's a black species. And as larvae, they feed on grasshopper eggs, so that makes them beneficial. However, when they come out in late summer, um, they tend to be gregarious. They, seem, they like to feed together on different plants. Anemone, you'll see them on tomato, potato, beans, a whole bunch of different plants. And so uh, they're not actually very active flyers. So when you see them, if they're causing damage to something that you adore and would like to preserve, um, you have to be careful, but you can uh, try to gather them up or whatever and dispose of them or something. Uh, blister beetles, the name, of course, means that they secrete a substance called cantharidin in their, uh, from their bodies when they're disturbed. And if it gets on your skin, it will produce a blister. So they have to be very carefully handled. Or uh, otherwise, you can just do them in with carbaryl. But, re but remember that they are, in fact, beneficial in helping suppress grasshopper populations. Excellent, thank you, Jim. All right, this is a viewer from Shenandoah, Iowa, okay. who has sent us a series of wascally wabbit pictures. That's a rabbit? Well, that would be the cherry tomato. Oh, that there would be the rabbit. And he yep. says the, the, the tomato was over eight feet tall, the rabbit plucked it, ate it, and then the third image is... Oh, he's sorry he ate it. <laughs> He's trying to apologize. <laughs> Look at that. Oops, I wasn't supposed to eat that one, was I? That's the, the anthropomorphic. So, so his, his comment here is he thought they ate lettuce and clover and all sorts of other things. Had no idea they would actually pluck off cherries and no, tomatoes. No, um, they're very opportunistic. If it's a vegetable and it's juicy, they'll eat it. Um, I've even seen them eat marigolds. So many people say plant marigolds around, stops the rabbits. No. You'll get rabbits that like marigolds. So, I think if it's luscious and juicy, the rabbits will and, eat it. You know, like with tomatoes, if you just pick them earlier than the rabbits or squirrels would get them, that's a yeah. good good solution, right? Yeah, you can pick them early. They might a be slightly a, on the yeah. pink side, but right. mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, I think a fence would probably work just as well because I have come across rabbits feeding on green tomatoes. They mm. will take them when they're green as well. So. Mm. Wascalies. Yep. Okay. All right, Amy. Um, this is a viewer that has sent in an image of smoke tree or smoke bush, mm -hmm. one of the purple foliaged ones. We've had this question a couple times this season too. The branches look great and then boom, they start to die. I would lean toward verticillium wilt on this. Uh, verticillium is a soil borne fungus. It affects the vascular system. The trick of verticillium, and if you ever, you know, last week we were at Loretz and Gardens and that's a prime example they get rid of psyllium in a lot of their woody trees there. One year they look absolutely terrible and then the next year they're nice, lush, and green. Um, there's no real explanation why the verticillium actually plugs up the vascular system, but some years you'll see it a lot worse than others. Um, I wouldn't get too crazy with the pruning, just let it be. Next year your smoke tree might look absolutely beautiful. Um, but if it persists for several years, you may want to consider replacing that plant with a species that is not susceptible to verticillium wilt. All right, thanks, Amy. Jeff, you have a, uh, a couple of maple questions from two different viewers. Okay. One is October Glory Maple, uh, two of them planted two or three years ago, West House in the fall, um, direct sun most of the day, and, and they were given the advice to go ahead and paint those trunks and do some treatment and so forth. The question on those is whether these are healthy trees, whether the paint is an option, what do we think on that? You know, sometimes the, they'll do that to uh, help a sense called in the winter, and it, unfortunately it looks like those trees have already had damage, so I think it's a little late on the painting um, to help prevent that. So 
that, that one stem with the painted stem did not look good and I would say is probably uh, the option would be to replace it. And I believe that your third picture is, uh, we have a lot of questions about autumn blaze. It's a little hard to tell in there, but but uh, one side of the tree on the autumn blaze maple is already beginning to color up. Mm -hmm. Is that? And that's not really unusual. A, a lot of our maples, and we'll start seeing them. I noticed today that there's some trees that are starting to go into its fall color. And this time of year, that's not highly unusual. So I think sometimes when trees leaf early, and some of those do have uh, early leaves that we'll see a little earlier fall color on some of those. All right, thanks. All right, uh, Jim, you get a question here. This is a Milford viewer who has blue spruce. The needles are turning red and then dropping off and eventually the tree dies. Might be a path question as well, but I, I believe you've had some issues with this already. This I'm thinking year. possibly spruce mites, um, but we tend to have the, the needles turn more of the golden color. They're whitish, bleachy looking, then a golden color, color, and then they're always messy looking with debris and some webbing in them. So I would probably defer maybe to what uh, Amy may suggest. If they're that kind of a purpley color, it's usually um, Saracocca shoot blight. Uh, very common in blue spruce. I've seen a lot of it this year. Best thing to do, especially if it's a younger tree, um, you need to go in and prune out those areas. It's always going to start at the bottom of the tree and work its way up, but then you're going to come in with a fungicide application. And like I said earlier, with the tree, you're most likely going to have to have a commercial applicator because if it's a 50 foot blue, 50 foot blue, f blue spruce, <laughs> tongue <laughs> twister tonight, you, there's no way as a homeowner you're ever going to be able to spray the whole thing. Um, so you'll have to bring somebody in to spray it. But most of your fungicides is going to be like a mancazeb or a copper base. It's probably what your best options are going to be to treat those trees. All right, thanks. All right, so speaking of creatures, this is a viewer in Lincoln who has creatures on the baby bur oak leaves, but they're not Dennis's creatures, they're yours. The tree is only about 18 inches tall. Before he clipped the leaf off, they were lined up in a straight line on what was mm -hmm. left of the green part of the leaf. Yeah, that, you know, he's, before he clipped the leaf off, that's an excellent strategy for control. Just put it in the trash or whatever. Those are called uh, scarlet oak sawflies, and that's because they probably were originally discovered on scarlet oak, but they get on other oaks, many other oaks, and they're kind of like grubby snail. They look like snails or slugs, you know, because they're shiny, greenish, caterpillars, uh, they have two generations, maybe three during a season, and uh, they're not usually important enough to control, and just that one simple solution of pulling off the leaf or dislodging them really does a great deal in helping them, but most oak trees are so large, and they're not gonna suffer any significant damage from them. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, Dennis, this is a viewer who is grow actually growing edamame and lima beans, which is fun. But she says something eats the beans and, the, and leaves the pods virtually overnight. The green beans aren't affected as much. She does have two types of rabbit fencing surrounding the garden. She wonders if it could be a squirrel or a mouse. I would say it could be what we looked at earlier, the voles. Um, it's hard to see the teeth marks, but um, either a vole or a ground squirrel, 13 line ground squirrel, would love to open those up and take those beans. So, uh, and they can get through a lot of rabbit fencing and they can climb the rabbit fencing, especially a 13 line ground squirrel would climb. And so you almost have to almost put a bird netting over the top to, to keep them keep out. Them out. Hmm. Interesting. All right, Amy, um, about three different tomato questions, one of which goes to you and then maybe back to Jim. The first is, is this a blight of fungi? One is really bad, brown leaves throughout. The other three plants of this type are showing the same signs. Um, he says they were fine a week ago. Did not say which uh, cultivar it is. And then the, other, the next one is Roma tomatoes that have been showing more and more and more issues. They've done seven, they don't really put anything else on them, and then they also wonder if the tomatoes are good to eat. Okay, we'll start with the Romas right here. If you take a look at them, you're going to see those lesions on the leaf. And um, when I saw the pictures earlier this week, I was able to blow them up a little bit further. And if you look really close, there's actually the rings in those spots, and that's early blight. Early blight will grow in rings, just like uh, rings of a tree. And the viewer said they've been using seven. Seven is an insecticide. That isn't a fungicide type product. Um, you can clip those, those uh, petioles off and throw them away. Soaker hoses, ground cover was great, um, but with the rains that we have been getting, soaker hoses don't make a difference. The rain's gonna splash those spores up. So you're gonna wanna come in with a fungicide if you wanna treat. You're gonna use a copper-based product, 
but be, please be very careful with coppers. If we get hot again, you can actually burn the foliage. And the romas on them are perfectly fine to eat, even if you don't treat them. Uh, usually the fruit isn't affected. Now, the first two pictures that we saw where they said there, one tomato was really affected, didn't see anything. You can see the browning pattern is a lot different on those. And you go to the second image, you see that yellow speckling, and that will shoot you right over to Jim. Yeah, Amy knows, and she can probably explain it just as well, that uh, those are spider mites. And so, yes, when it gets really hot outside, they explode in population. They start moving very quickly. And before you know it, the plant is just completely destroyed. So I would, I mean, it's, we still have some season left, and it's that bad. I would probably take it out because it serves as a reservoir for the spider mites to be blown to other locations in the garden. And guess what? They don't like just tomatoes. They like just about anything in the garden. So try to take care of it uh, very quickly. The All other right. thing I like with spider mites is you get that nice webbing in yeah, between underneath. the leaves that you can see. Yeah. You can't see the mites themselves. Yeah, excellent. All right, thanks. Uh, Jeff, you have a viewer who um, has found a shrub that they'd like some identification on. And shaded by overhead trees sends new shoots from oh. the base, easily spreads. They want to know what it is. They're curious so they can find out more about it. Sure. Well, that is our elderberry. Mm -hmm. So it's a common native shrub and grows in, oh, you know, kind of edge locations a lot of times uh, in uh, low areas that are a little wet. Uh, you can find it. Um, so I'm, I'm sure it's doing really well for it. In, in sunnier locations, uh, it might set a little bit more fruit in my flower a little bit more. And, uh, but the fruit's edible, you know, grandmas make good elderberry jelly and that sort of thing out of it. And I'm sure Jim makes elderberry wine out of his at home. So <laughs> knowing Jim like I do, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so it's a, it's kind of a fun plant, but it will spread. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've actually had a prop up or pop up in my yard a, a few times and Mm -hmm. uh, it's always tempting to keep it, but I, I take it out because I don't want to end up with elderberry everywhere. So. And there is a cut leaf variety that's really pretty as right. well. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, we actually had a viewer send us a, a picture that I think we can probably describe pretty well if, if we can't see it exactly. This is a superior <coughs> viewer who um, has, has issues with her peach and they have all these globby things on the trunk and, and she, it's six years old. She's had a lot of trouble with this particular tree. She wonders what it is and, and what to do. It starts with, and she's got small brown peach spots on the peaches too, but it's yeah. this trunk thing that I think is most I think maybe Amy and I could both share on this response here. Yeah. Uh, I was, when I saw this, I was, I, I was amazed at how many uh, oozing points there are on the, on the trunks or branches or whatever you call them. Because at first I thought it was borers, you know, because we do have peach tree borer and there could be some peach tree borer in there. Um, they'll get up on the branch junctions, that's where you see a lot of the oozing, but, and also at the base. But this is up and down the branches, so Everywhere. I'm suspecting that there's more than just that. I would be suspecting maybe a bacterial canker. On the fruit itself, she shows some spots on the fruit. Uh, that's actually shot hole, that's a bacterial disease. Um, so it's very easily, it could be both. And if there's any peach borers in there, it's prime opportunity for those bacterial canker diseases to get in there. And the tree's stressed. And with all that activity, it's this, this ooze coming out of it left and right. Um, longevity of the tree probably isn't the best at this point in time. And if you've been struggling with it for a while, um, there's been some issues for a while, then probably. Time to go. Time to go. Replace it. This right. fall will be a great time to replant it. All right. Thanks. Uh, Dennis, this is an Omaha Elkhorn area viewer mm -hmm. with moles, voles, lawn and landscape beds, moles, voles eating lawn and landscape. <laughs> and <laughs> he's tried stomping the tunnels, electronic devices, poison worms, treating for webworms all over the neighborhood. So this okay. is apparently in Well, we got two different things that feed on completely different food items. The mole feeds on earthworms primarily, not grubs, not webworms especially, but mainly earthworms. So if you're watering a lot and you have a lot of earthworms, you're feeding the moles. Uh, there are a lot of mole traps out there that can work. Um, they're somewhat labor intensive. I found many people have good luck with uh, worms out there and the over the counter product is Tomcat for moles. Follow the directions exactly. It's funny because if the commercial person does it and follows the directions, they have excellent luck. Yet 
a lot of times the homeowner says it's not working, and that's telling me someone's not following the directions. Um, and it's so, not the mole, right? Right, it's not the mole. <laughs> Uh, for the voles, the traps seem to work, and, the, and the, the voles with a V are herbivores. They're eating grains and things like that. And so there must be a lot of bird seed on the ground, dead seeds around in the beds, and things like that. We have a great neb guy on each one, so give those a try. All right, and, and occasionally, of course, it is you just sort of give up and hope you have planted enough of whatever it is for whoever wants to have a bite of it. Or, or bring in the bull snake. Or <laughs> there you go, you know, well, and, and then best, work. the bull snake will right down those holes and eat up those moles and go right down those holes and eat up all those voles. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that, and, that and would, then they're happy when they come out. <laughs> and that would be a poem of some sort. Yes. <laughs>